Hello, Ender Sword here again, this time with a Bronze League game. We're going to be looking at a Terran versus Zerg. The Terran player that we're focusing on is Flakes here in the bottom left-hand corner. And the Zerg player opponent is going to be Cenus over here in the top right-hand corner, and we're on Shakura's Plateau. So for those of you who don't know, on Shakura's Plateau, you cannot spawn in the opposite position, so you can't spawn on the same side of the map as yourself, like your opponent can't spawn there, so they will always be on the uh, opposite side from you, um, not necessarily diagonally, but just on the, if you're on the right-hand side of the map, they've got to be on the left-hand side of the map and, and vice versa. So the Terran player that we're focusing on today is actually someone that I met at a barcraft here in Toronto. Uh, we met at the NASL finals, and while we were there, we had a computer set up where a few people were playing, and I actually saw this player do their first five placement matches onto the ladder, and he did get placed bronze. I think uh, ended up going 0-5, although should have really won the last game. It turned into a little bit of a base race, and he was just a little slow in getting another building down, but he had the bigger army. In either case, he's been uh, continuing on and doing fairly decently in bronze so far. So this replay is just from today, and I'm going to take a look at uh, what we can do in terms of general mechanics and gameplay style to improve this game. So the top three things that I'm going to look at during this replay are number one, macro, as always. So I'm going to just kind of all encompass on that, looking at constantly building out of things, looking at supply blocking yourself, making sure that we're keeping up worker production, everything like that. Just making sure that the build is fairly well executed and that we're constantly using um, the things available to us to gain an advantage. The second thing that we're going to look at, and it plays a very huge part in this game, is scouting. Constantly being aware of what your opponent is doing, not only by physically seeing uh, what is going on, but also inferring what they must be doing, knowing what is seems to be missing or knowing in what direction they are probably going and then responding to that as well. The third thing I'm going to look at is how to respond to what you do actually see. So in a few places in this game, despite being shown direct evidence of what's going on, the response is not necessarily perfectly appropriate for what we do see our opponent uh, doing in the game. So that's something we're, we're going to focus on as well. So we can see a pretty standard opening here. He is going for the wall off. It is against a Zerg player, uh, getting a Marine out with uh, the tech lab. It does send his scout over and uh, takes a look through Cenus's base. The thing uh, which is notable here is that there's no um, that there's no expansion here. We know that there's no expansion going down here this early. Instead, he was able to see that these two buildings are, uh, in fact, underway. This was a spine crawler, so it uh, doesn't tell you a lot other than he's going to be pretty defensive. Usually, if he was going for an expansion, then you wouldn't get that right in your own mineral line, and uh, especially not blocking your own uh, gas production, and, of course, the spawning pool going down. So you, what you would often want to do in this case is be poking back at this expansion to see whether anything is going to be added to this in the near future. You want to know the exact timing that he is going to add something on, and if he doesn't, then you can certainly be expecting, say, a one base all in, a very strong attack uh, coming out of here. So the fact that he put the spine crawlers down kind of indicates that he thinks he may be vulnerable for a period of time until he texts to the thing that he wants, in this case probably the roaches. Um, so that does just give you an indication of what your opponent is probably going to be doing and what he's thinking of doing. So by keeping an eye in this area, and there would be nothing to prevent another SEV, another Marine from coming back and just poking at that a little later on, you could obviously drop a scan, probably not the most efficient way, but if you had to, just drop a scan in the area to see when that's going down. It's very important information to know whether or not you're going to get all in or what's, uh, what's actually going on. 
So he is opting for a Hellion opening. Um, he's going for two factories, one upgrading the blue flame, the other with a uh, reactor add-on so that he can really start pumping out Hellions. Also going for the expansion here. Given that we saw that this was a bit of a one base play, the expansion itself may be a little risky. If you're going to, if you're going to see that one base play, it's very often completely mass, mass, mass ling, or it is more likely going to be a one, uh, one base roach play, where they just come with a lot of roaches and hit you pretty hard, in which case it can often be uh, a bit harder to hang on to this expansion. We do see, however, that there is no real pressure here at this point. There's no need to lift uh, an orbital command for just one ling. That ling would take a couple minutes to actually beat that down. And you do have enough forces up here in the main base to deal with that. So you're just kind of losing um, time, losing mining time that could have been done here. A few of these could have been transferred down. You could be actually producing more SCVs out of this orbital command. So this is just hanging up in the air for no particular reason. Um, and it's allowing that uh, Ling to just be completely disruptive when there's really no need for it. That Ling wasn't actually any threat. So we want to avoid a situation where we're thrown off our game because of a little thing like that. In terms of actual production during this game so far, we've got the factory silent, factory silent, barracks silent, and uh, not adding any other production facilities. Our money right now was actually uh, pretty high. Um, there's a lot of gas here. We're accumulating a lot faster than we're actually producing out of things, not getting these marines up. The attention is now focused on this attack, so he's now got everything uh, paying attention to this attack and we're going to see that production at home just is suffering. There's no SCVs being made at home. Uh, once these Hellions that were already queued up are finished, we're just going to stop that production and he's very much focused on what's here. Once you see those roaches there, you know that you don't want to be assaulting them directly with Hellions. That's possibly one of the worst actual matchups in the game is a roach versus hellion. The hellions are just so inept uh, when faced with roaches that are actually surrounding them, getting an arc on them like that, and you're just not going to really do anything. So it's a good time to pull out, particularly when you are in a choke situation. They've caught you on the ramp. Uh, just poke up there, see the fact that there's no base right now, and just leave. That's what you want to do. There's no point in slamming your head against the wall and trying to go against that roach army. Just take the information that you've gotten and then go back home. Again, the orbital command here has actually pulled away preemptively, uh, thinking that there is going to be a counterattack, which of course there is. But there's no reason to necessarily pull it away that quickly. You can get the mining done out of it, and nothing has been mining from uh, this place so far. And because none of these are anti-air units, you can always just lift it up at the last second. Now, he is moving towards uh, this base uh, and landing here. Again, we're at max energy, so really mules should be going down. The moment this has landed, this you should now be producing SCVs out of it, now be dropping mules out of it, and uh, we've got about six mules worth of energy that have been stored up that should really be uh, mining out of it. But on top of everything, we're just not producing out of the things that are currently available to us. The Hellions here that he is still making are a bit uh, out of date now. We know that the roach army is here and the hellions are just so bad against these roaches that that shouldn't be what uh, what we're going for this should be this should have been immediately switched into basically tanker thor production and the barracks should have been uh, getting add-ons of tech labs to get some marauders out so that we've got the things that are direct uh, basically direct counters to the roaches uh, i don't always rely on those direct counters but it's just one of those situations where Hellions are so bad against the Roaches and Marauders are so good. It's almost two of the hardest counters in the game that it's just that high hit point armored unit and you've got this 
low armor light unit, anti light unit, when you've got this other option of this really heavy hitting anti armor unit. So it's just the type of switch that you do want to be making, and you want to be making fairly proactively. He knew several minutes ago that uh, that army was the thing that was coming out and was going to be counterattacking, so you do want your production uh, switching towards uh, that area. We also want to be throwing down more production facilities as even off uh, this one base, we're ending up with way more minerals than we are spending and way more gas than we're spending. So it is a good time to be getting, say, your upgrades going. You've got uh, plus one now. There's no reason not to add the plus one armor. You want to keep that sort of thing constantly going so that you can stay ahead of your opponent. Again, we've got the energy here just completely storing up. Uh, it was somewhat of a good idea to move this over to uh, this base since you didn't feel that you could secure the natural expansion. Uh, but definitely be dropping those mines and or those mules, and uh, you haven't been mining this entire time. So for at least several minutes here, there's been no SCP production and no actual mining occurring. The other thing to note here is the scouting information. If we look at what Flakes is able to see right now, he's aware, obviously, that the original base is there and that those original spine crawlers were there and so on, but he hasn't actually double-checked any information since then. We do know that this natural expansion doesn't have anything in it, or at least didn't as of a couple minutes ago. But the attacks that we've seen coming out of uh, our Zerg player here have been fairly large, and he's been pretty good at getting a replacement army out when we've destroyed the original one. So it kind of makes you think, where are these larvae coming from, and where's that income coming from if he's actually able to attack with this type of force? It can't really just be off one base, so what's going on? This is what should be cluing you into the idea that there is probably another base out there. It's not uh, very common for a very low-level player to be actually actively scouting around the map, although they certainly should be, and it's one of the things that can get you into the higher leagues. But you should definitely still be looking for when is this unusual? When should I be looking for a hidden base? And frankly, when someone's coming in with this type of army and they're replenishing it this quickly and they're not seeming to have any problems with, uh, with having enough money to do so, that should just tip you off to the fact that, well, there must be another base out there somewhere uh, that I'm not actually seeing. So you should then be sending something around to see where that is. Uh, the benefits, of course, of these hidden bases is that they're hidden and that you don't know where they are and it uh, just takes advantage of the fact that you're blind to it. But the major downfall to these hidden bases are exactly what we're seeing here in that they can't really be very easily defended. That because it's completely out in the open, a single force coming down can completely shut it down, completely kill the thing off, and uh, give you a very big advantage as the attacking army. There, the Terran player couldn't really do anything. It was a walled-off hidden base, uh, so that just has to move back home, and anything that's been gained there is, is kind of uh, gone from doing that. So this hidden base is pretty much equally vulnerable. There's nothing defending this at all. We've got a couple spore crawlers there, I guess, trying to prevent drops, although they're in very weird positions to do that. If the drop was to come at basically the natural point that a drop would come, it would still do a ton of damage. So a single medevac coming out with uh, eight marines would pretty much shut this base down. There'd be no problem at all. It's just a matter of being aware that it is uh, actually there. We can see, as mentioned before, the tank switch is done, but uh, there hasn't been a switch into Marauders, despite the fact that we are still pretty much constantly seeing uh, roaches being produced, in addition to the lings and a few banelings uh, centered in, or, or added into that, uh, that ball. So adding that uh, Marauder count, even just a few of them, does just give you a little more bulk. It can give you something to absorb baneling hits, it just gives you that extra attack versus armor. Tanks are pretty good at that as well. However, you don't generally want your tanks sitting around unseeds like that 
um, just attacking the armor, you want to get the splash damage. So by getting a few marauders out, that can again give you uh, a pretty good response to what we're seeing in this army. We get the uh, this push up, the tanks are caught completely on siege, everything is going to get surrounded, and this is a pretty big uh, route of what was a very valuable army. Um, there's still a fair bit of damage going on here. The Zerg player did just move in his mutas with everything else, so he did lose some very valuable forces um, with that army when he could have crushed that a lot more efficiently than he actually did. And uh, so that is very beneficial to the Terran player, but still with a slightly better, more thought out, slow push, you generally want to be moving your Terran army up with a few tanks sieged, moving it up, unseaging, resieging, kind of making a slightly slower push. There's no reason here to be very slow, but you don't want to just be charging up a ramp uh, with everything on siege so that when they come down at you, then you're kind of, well, do I siege stuff now or do I keep it on siege and see what damage it can do and so on. Given the tight, uh, tight ball of that army, just having even a couple of the siege tanks still sieged at the bottom of the ramp while the rest of the army was trying to move up would have made a really big difference in the outcome of that battle. And we saw that there were only actually a handful of units left at the end. It could have actually made the difference between uh, winning or losing in that case and it completely reset the tank down to not have that. Finally, we do have the mules all coming down in one area, but the original base is mined out. So even though we're kind of on two base now, it's always been in this game that only one base is actually actively mining at a given time, compared to throughout the entire game, the Zerg has actually had two bases going the entire time. So it's not the type of ideal situation you want to be in. More of an effort could have been done to uh, secure this base a little earlier and instead of opting for the, uh, the hidden base over here, which was eventually taken out by the Zerg player. And there also could have been a lot more effort to go around and do scouting to make sure that this hidden base simply did not exist in the first place. Everything in the universe indicates that this cannot possibly be the only base. There is no way that he's got a bunch of mutas, a bunch of hydras, an army full of roaches, lings, and banelings off this base. That's just not possible, so it should be really tipping you off that there is definitely something out there, and we should be checking every one of those locations. In contrast, look at the Zerg player <coughs> covering every possible expansion to make sure that there isn't another uh, hidden base going down, that he knows exactly when you're going to expand. The, oddly enough, didn't cover this one location here, but he does have the watchtower, which is going to tell him if, uh, if something's able to land here. He's actually got, uh, got vision in that area, um, that, so he's going to know whether anything comes down uh, here or not. So pretty much has all the pages covered compared to the Terran, who is so in the dark about what's happening, it's just uh, putting them at a distinct uh, disadvantage uh, in this game. The one saving grace to all this at the moment is that the Zerg player has not upgraded anything. Um, when we compare that to the 1-1 upgrades of the Terran army in, in his bio forces, it does make a really, really big difference. Even just getting the 1-1 one -one on your Marines versus a Zergling army that is just 0-0, zero -zero, Roaches that are 0-0, zero -zero, didn't even upgrade the Mutalisks. That's usually just an automatic for Zerg players that they'll at least get plus one attacks because of how well it works for the, um, the bounce attacks that they do. So just that lack of upgrades is what's allowing this Terran player to still be in the game and still be here with uh, relatively even supply, despite really not having this base up at all during the majority of the game. It does go for a uh, third command center here, but it's kind of hard to say where he's going to safely move that to. This would be the most likely location, and if uh, this was the one picked, then you very often want to be going with a planetary fortress as opposed to the orbital command that he does 
opt to go for here. Uh, just because it's a little more out in the open, this is the most defensible location, having that ramp there. So by getting a planetary fortress here, it kind of deals with the fact that this is a little more wide open uh, than the rest of the area, and it gives you some time to actually get this army down, get it here, get it sieged up, and so on. It just uh, does defend itself. In general, you want your third base to be a planetary fortress. There are exceptions to that. When you don't feel that you could be attacked, maybe it's a hidden third. Maybe it's just in a place that you do have very good um, army support in that area and you're not as concerned about it. But generally speaking, you do want to just get that in place, turn it into a planetary, and allow it to defend itself against uh, some of the quick counterattacks that the Zerg army can be doing. So we do get the uh, remaxing, not really maxing of the army, but a rebuild up of this army. Again, there's really no move to add marauders into this. Now, I know that uh, just marines and tanks is usually a very strong style against uh, the mutiling bane play of the Zerg player. However, when they're moving into mutiling bane roach, it is good to have just that extra... It doesn't even have to be that many, but just that extra layer of protection against the banelings and against the roaches by just having a little wall of uh, marauders there so that they can just bane that sort of thing down as opposed to letting the marines just fire at roaches for a fairly long time. It allows them to, um, to just more directly, I guess, counter it, especially since roaches are generally one of the best things to kind of get in close and take... Uh, some of those tanks out. In this case, the composition of the Terran army is pretty good, so it's not going to make a huge difference uh, during this game. This does look like the next push is going to be pretty hard to stop. Even a few Vikings mixed in. Not necessarily an efficient use of uh, resources here. It would have been actually nicer to see these become medevacs as opposed to Vikings. The Vikings just aren't particularly good against uh, mutilisks. They just kind of take a little bit longer um, to get their damage done, and but they can distract uh, fire and, and so on. They're not completely worthless, but I think you'd get a lot better yield if that was um, five medevacs as opposed to um, these six, I guess six medevacs, whatever, as opposed to these Vikings here. They're not... Their rate of fire is just a little slow. They're not going to be as useful unless they're actually focusing something down. There's no real splash damage. He would have been better off with a single core uh, with those medevacs, whatever, uh, healing your army. Disengagement's, again, not the best, but it's just such an overwhelming force at this point that it doesn't matter. You do want those siege tanks, a couple of them sieged at the bottom. Uh, this army moving up into the area. Note he didn't even stem that army. It was that, uh, that big of a mess, although you do generally want to be stemming into a fight like that. And he does wipe that base out, and it's just such a, uh, such a strong force at this point compared to the Zerg's completely unupgraded force. Uh, it does end up with 2-1 here against still a 0-0 army. So he is able to actually walk over the Zerg player, but we should note again that not picking up this base put us at an extreme disadvantage for the majority of the game, and we actually had to destroy a lot more stuff uh, compared to what we would have had to have destroyed. Um, here you can see that the Zerg player has lost over 5,000 minerals more worth of stuff, so it was good that as a player, um, Flakes was able to actually accomplish that and destroy that, but he shouldn't have had to. Uh, he shouldn't have put the Zerg in a position where he was able to simply make 5,000 minerals more worth of stuff, or not just minerals, but minerals and gas worth of stuff, and had to deal with that. So even though he did deal with that well and was able to wipe them down, you can't... Uh, you can't put yourself in a position where you need to do that because a slightly better player, someone that's going to actually upgrade their stuff, someone that's going to position it better, engage better, and so on, will be able to take you down with that type of an advantage of an extra few thousand resources, uh, several thousand resources put into their army. 
So the Terran player does end up uh, winning the day here, but there are definitely a lot of improvements uh, to be made, both in general macro, um, keeping yourself with full production, making sure that these things are actually producing at any given time. During this final attack here, I know it can often be tempting to just be like, oh, well, I just have to, just have to push and I'm going to win anyway, but be making things anyway. We're back at home not actually using any of these facilities. So this entire producer of new armies is not actually producing new armies for us. So what if something did happen here? What if there was a really good baneling hit that right on this ramp could have literally destroyed dozens of these marines? Uh, we would obviously need to be replacing that army and going back out into the field and that's just not what's occurring. Uh, this orbital command was kind of forgotten, so again, you want to be expanding behind these attacks and not just kind of forgetting what we were doing and what the plan was and getting focused in on the attack itself. So as that attack's moving out, this orbital command should really be floating over to this area and we should be planning to establish that base. Obviously, SCV should be continued uh, continue to be made at 32 minutes in the game. There's only 25 SCVs on the field. That doesn't even make any sense. There needs to be like 60 or 70 out at this point. And note that this is also not really a result of any big killing off of SCVs or anything that happened during this game. Um, there wasn't an instance where, say, a bunch of lings got in and destroyed your mineral line. That's not what happened. It was just really a lack of production of them. There were a few lost in this hidden base, but not really even uh, that many. If I do check the units lost uh, tab here, then I'm pretty sure that, yeah, workers killed 13 and 2. Again, you're supposed to be in like the 60s, 70s at this point in the game. 13 and 2 is not making the uh, the difference there in what's resulting in both players having 24 and 25 uh, workers available. So that's something that can really, really uh, turn the tide of the game and again balance out uh, some of those resources in differences, uh, resource differences in how the Zerg player ha was able to simply spend a lot more on their army and created an army that really had to be beat down uh, very strongly in order to win this game. So overall, definitely a lot of improvement on when I saw Flakes play just about a week ago at the NASL um, where he did his placement matches. So I understand that he has been winning quite a few games in bronze and this is certainly head and shoulders a lot better. And uh, But there are certainly some areas to improve here. And I hope to get a chance to look at a few of his games uh, a little further down the road. And we can actually be tracking someone from all the way uh, from placement and see where they ultimately uh, end up over the next couple of months. Should be pretty neat to look at. Uh, so again, I hope that was helpful for everyone, especially Flakes out there. And uh, keep on watching.